Okay, hello people of YouTube. This is my first video with my actual voice on it. And so this video is about Cold Fusion. Well, perhaps more accurately termed LENR, Low Energy Nuclear Reactions. But um, it's basically in defense of it, and I'm trying to explain why I think that there should be more research into it and why I think it should be reconsidered by the mainstream scientific community instead of being considered junk science, uh, according to Wikipedia. Now, I do think that we should take this area seriously because um, basically the fusion of a kilogram of deuterium is equivalent to about seven times the energy contained in the fuel of a 747 jet. So, let me go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so as shown by this pie chart here, um, the funding that's gone into hot fusion is just so much larger than what's gone into cold fusion. I mean, the cold fusion funding is basically represented by the little blue sliver, and hot fusion represents the rest of it, the orange. And by the way, this isn't even this isn't even all the like toll budget that's been spent around the world. This is just what I could easily add up. And even so, it dwarfs the funding into coal fusion. Okay, so when thinking about dealing with waste and producing energy, the device Mr. Fusion from Back to the Future certainly comes to mind. Now, this device, um, you put waste in and energy comes out, which, is, which would be really nice if that could be done. And, but I think there's actually some plausibility to this because there is uh, so there is the uh, plasma gasification process where basically you use you use plasma torches, plasma to completely vaporize materials and turn them into mainly carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and then you power stuff from the hydrogen. Uh, now, however, the Back to the Future here. The device, Mr. Fusion, uses fusion energy to do that. Now, the problem is, even if we can make hot fusion work, it really seems like making them smaller and actually usable like this is another task on its own. Because, I mean, keep in mind that, you know, at this point, the largest fusion uh, project that's being worked on, ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor looks like this. So, yeah, that's a problem. I mean, it doesn't seem like it's very clear how or when even, if it can be done, they're going to be able to shrink it down. Um, I mean, there's extremely high temperatures involved, radiation involved, electronic emissions involved, which would also be a problem. Hopefully you can shield that all, but I'm, I'm saying that would also add to the, the weights. There might be some like limits to how how light you can make it because you need like a significant amount of shielding in addition to the reactor itself. So but anyway, if you want to get to if you want to get to a reactor it's like uh, Mr. Fusion from Back to the Future, you clearly need cold fusion or uh, the other term for it, L E N R. So so, for those who don't know about cold fusion, or how it's originally, or how it's originally termed cold fusion, um, two scientists, Martin Fleischmann, a leading electrochemist, and Stanley Pons, in 1989, announced that they discovered the device that's shown as somewhat simplified illustration here, uh, can produce excess heat and an amount of excess heat that wouldn't be explained or wouldn't be explainable by chemical processes. So it had to be a nuclear reaction. And it would seem it would have to be fusion because if it was fission, it would make even less sense. But yeah, fusion. Um, however, I have put, put here that um, the, the, the more accurate name is LENR because it may be operating on some other nuclear reaction besides nuclear fusion, and I will kind of describe that later on. So, 
Yeah, but basically it's pretty simple. I mean, it, well, when I say pretty simple, I mean in general it's pretty simple, but actually making it really reliably work, that's not so simple. But nevertheless, you can see how there are just a few basic parts to it. So this was the analysis done by Professor Peter, ha Peter excuse me, Peter Hagelstein of MIT, and basically uh, it shows that starting with 217 negative result experiments, experiments with negative results, um, if you eliminate the experiments which incorrectly measure the effects by radiation emitted, which part of the idea of cold fusion is also that it doesn't emit hardly any radiation compared to hot fusion, and you also eliminate the ones that don't talk about the loading ratio or that basically don't reach or, uh, or accordingly don't reach a loading ratio of, of greater than uh, 0 0.9, you end up with only three negative experiments left. Now this is important because this loading ratio is basically the, the key, I think, or one of the keys to actually making cold fusion work. So the problem is uh, once you take that into account, I mean, it, you, you suddenly reduce a, a number of negative experiments so much that now you can say, well, it's had a lot less negative results compared to hot fusion. I mean, it's so much less. So that isn't fair. Now we can also talk about the fact that the third point was about uh, how the original experiment may not have uh, been descriptive enough, the one by Pons and Fleischmann. And that is fair because they, I don't think they uh, actually described or at least concretely point out the importance of this loading ratio, which is, by the way, the, the, the ratio of hydrogen to palladium. Now, contrary to popular belief, there are positive results, and one of them is by a reputable scientist in Japan named Yoshiaki Arata. Uh, I believe I pronounced that right. Uh, and this basically, as you can see from a slide, he basically forced the deuterium into palladium, and this kind of helped ensure that there is a lot of that deuterium in there, which uh, I believe may have been the reason that actually worked. And we also are, uh, have to take a look at the more recent positive results in 2018 by other Japanese scientists, because in Japan, this research has been going on a lot more, whereas in America, it's kind of stuck in limbo. Um, I mean, ever since the negative results started piling in, in the 90s, and you know, and there was, there's also a possibility that there was something nefarious going on. I mean, there was the scientist Eugene Malov, who basically throughout the 90s continued to assert that this effect is real. And I mean, this was, he was a serious scientist and I mean, he wasn't some joker. And, and basically also asserted that uh, some of the original results may have been very slightly or subtly manipulated so that they look negative and not positive. And um, strangely enough, he was violently killed in 2004, which is kind of a creepy thing that happened. Um, not that there's necessarily solid evidence that was anything uh, nefarious, but it was kind of weird. But anyway, back to the science of this. Okay, now this is definitely an article I want to draw attention to. Um, and I did try to put a source citation for it, but um, obviously it didn't like fit that well into this video of a slide. So I guess I'll have to put that in the description. But basically this is a report out that came out in 2018. And what this shows is that uh, scientists in Japan have been getting positive results from uh, cold fusion experiments with palladium and uh, deuterium or uh, heavy water. And this is a very interesting theory as to what might be going on. So basically, first of all, the idea is that when there's enough of uh, deuterium or possibly regular hydrogen um, in the 
the atomic matrix or the molecular structure, I guess you could say, of palladium, uh, there's this sort of this sort of film of electrons on the outside because they're sort of in a quantum-like state. And because of that, um, protons from hydrogen uh, basically are, uh, or well, hydrogen or deuterium are attracted to it. And what happens is that these protons entangle, and so they act like some kind of gigantic proton in a way. And the electrons also do that. And then that leads to the next step. Now, once the protons and electrons are in this quantum state, um, what can basically happen now is uh, some energy from the environment. It could be from, in the form of light, heat, electricity. Somehow or another, this energy um, basically can be absorbed by this outer um, sheet of electrons. Uh, which can, and this is kind of weird part, but this would hypothetically cause them to fuse with the protons and become neutrons. Um, and then these, these neutrons will basically go and bump into atoms in the palladium and cause fusion to occur. And then when this happens, basically, uh, this will then cause gamma rays to be emitted, but these gamma rays can basically get absorbed by the electrons um, on the outside, the outer sheet of electrons, and th then they're absorbed and I guess scattered and emitted as heat. So that prevents there from being a lot of radiation. Now the funny thing is this actually kind of reminds me of uh, the concept which I think was also proposed by um, Pierre Hagelstein, um, who I cited earlier. But basically, this means that, um, or I, I should say that this compares in the sense that uh, in the other way of thinking of it, gamma rays are emitted from uh, nuclear reactions going on inside of the palladium, and they get reabsorbed. And basically, when gamma rays are absorbed by something, the, the nuclei, um, it'll essentially cause them to fuse because uh, the gamma ray has energy that's that high, and then it gets re-emitted by the atoms which just fused, and then uh, it gets reabsorbed and re-emitted again and again uh, until those gamma rays are scattered and end up as lower energy photons, or until it's just radiated away as heat because of the uh, atomic uh, last vibrating. Okay, so let's put this together. Basically, guys, um, I think that cold fusion or low energy nuclear reactions, and I'm saying both of those because some people know by one, some people know it more by the other. Um, but basically, I think this field, uh, I think it, it's it's still there's still a lot of evidence that this effect is completely real, and I don't think it's fair that scientists nowadays might dismiss it because of some stuff that happened in the past and uh and basically i mean considering now we're we're already spending like 20 something billion on thermonuclear fusion we're thinking of spending another 45 billion on it um i mean i think we need to put at least a little more money into this field because i mean it, and keep in mind there ha there has been a fair amount of money that's been put into it but I mean, clearly not enough, and I think that at the time, they really understand what they are trying to, to do in the experiments, so that might have screwed things up. Um, and, and nowadays, we have more nanotechnology, so I think it will be possible to figure out, okay, does it, is there enough deuterium in the experiment? Um, are we meeting the right conditions, and what are we trying to achieve? And basically... I think that with some well thought out research, we can also use this uh, as a sort of real life Mr. Fusion because basically trash, when it goes through a plasma gasification process, <clears throat> can be used as, as, as energy because it produces hydrogen. And now hydrogen can potentially be used 
um, to generate energy through fusion because you know hydrogen can be used as fusion fuel. Now most of the experiments with cold fusion were using uh, deuterium, but I think that it, it is at least conceivable that hydrogen could also work if this experiment, excuse me, if this effect is real. Uh, and I mean, there's a lot of possibilities for this in the future because if this stuff can work, I mean, this will get us closer to having like real life Iron Man suits um, because you could you could have exoskeletons as, as well as other futuristic technologies like um, like cars and robots and and especially exoskeletons which um, act as jetpacks like the one that Richard Browning designed. You can have these operate and, and, and fly for a much longer amount of time and potentially uh, with more power, depending on what the maximum power output of these cells is. Um, but I do think that, I mean, I think that this is kind of the missing piece in uh, the technology that we're developing nowadays because we're, we're still missing the energy piece. I mean, if we could do that, that would, um, that would also help space travel um, and honestly, it'd be nice to see a new uh, piece of technology that actually like changes things in a more like direct, serious way. Because um, it feels like with the advances in information technology, things are just getting a little faster. But the the playing ground uh, or the battleground or the whatever you call it, life itself, it's not changing. Is directly because I mean, you you still have you know people going about their their, their day in just a normal way like we've done throughout the decades, and it'd be interesting to see more people who are like using this to, like fly around or something. It would really it, it really get a lot of people into science and technology, and I mean that's kind of why I got into this stuff. Um, so so yeah, uh, hmm. I'm thinking there's something else I should say right now. Um, I am, I'm not sure how many of these videos I am going to be doing or what my schedule could be like. Uh, I mean, I, I do, I do encourage you to, to share this video because I don't know, part of why I haven't made a video all this time is I kind of feel like I'm going to put it out and then it's going to get like a few views over like a week or two and then the next week or two gets a few more views or something like that. I'd hope it'd be more than that and I am hopeful but I don't know I just uh, it feels like it's going to take so long for me to gain a lot of views and subscribers but nevertheless you gotta start somewhere. Um, but listen I, I really do I really do think I mean I, I think that as somebody who could potentially have a lot of subscribers if I ever do. I will try to put forward a lot of important information, as do others. I mean, there are a lot. There are a lot of other people on YouTube uh, who I, I I could name names, but there are a lot of others on YouTube who do put out a lot of good information and you get a fair amount of views. So I'm, I'm glad there are people who are doing that. Uh, but there are things that maybe people aren't talking about that much or in a direct enough way. And I figured I'd start with this because I haven't seen enough. <clears throat> I haven't seen recent videos on this uh, subject and in support of it in particular. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I guess I've been talking for a little while here. Got to work on that. Um, but yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys or whoever's watching. Girls. Well, guys can be used to describe girls and boys, men and women, but I, <laughs> never mind. Okay, take care.